Hello everyone, on today's episode of the One Year Life Challenge, we're going to talk about money, how it impacts your life, and what life is really all about. Hello everyone, today I want to talk about the subject of money. It's a really important subject. Every time I talk to, it feels like every time I talk to people about making big changes in their life, they go, what will I do for money? So it really seems to be something we need to understand. And your money or your life is a concept that um, recently I've been looking into and studying and looking at how, is it, you know, am I wrong? Is, is money a huge impact on people's lives? We've done some videos on the scientific basis of money and how at certain levels it produces no increase in happiness and at certain levels it actually it decreases happiness. Today we want to talk about the fulfillment curve, which is another so, um, scientific principle about money. And as always, I'm going to start with a quote, and this is one of my favorite quotes of all time. John D. Rockefeller was once asked at a press conference, being the richest man in the world at the time, how much money does a man need to be happy? To which John D. Rockefeller replied, just a little bit more. Isn't that true? Greed, which is the need for a little bit more, is so insidious. And it is the ultimate practical joke on humanity. Why? Because we're told once we become millionaires, we'll be happy. And when we become millionaires, we realize it hasn't changed our state. We know during the, the hedonic treadmill that we've talked about in the past, the scientific principle of um, aligning yourself to your, your current circumstances and going back to your natural happiness curve, people realize that it mustn't be a million, it must be more than a million, therefore I just need some more money. I worked in an industry in which was a really well remunerated industry and it was a tough industry though, very stressful, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was an incredibly stressful industry. However, the incomes were huge and everyone would tell me when I'd say, you know, is this, should we be doing this? Is it worth our health, what we're doing? Is it worth our stress? Is it worth the, the 80 hour work weeks? And people would say, listen, I'm going to retire when I'm 35. I'm going to retire in two years. I'm going to retire and when I retire, it will all be worth it. Those guys never retired. They got to 35, 37, 40, 42. They never retired because they needed just a little bit more. Just a little bit more is the disease of greed. And unfortunately, we need to understand it before it just dissolves us. So what is the fulfillment curve? So the fulfillment curve, which we'll just put up on the screen right now, is a basically a fulfillment versus money spent situation. Now, I'm not denying that having some money is not going to help you in life. It's definitely going to help. We live in a capitalist society. You're going to need money for things like, as you see on the graph, survival and comforts. Now, there is a point where you have a TV. You don't need three TVs. You have clothes and you have food. And once you've reached that level, you really have enough. Now, interestingly, we don't, we're told by society that it's, you know, it's, it's excess. If you've got a handbag, you need three. In fact, you need a Mimco one, you need a Burberry one, and you need you know, a Prada one. And what happens is we go into the area of overconsumption. Now, what's really interesting about overconsumption is it leads to a lack of fulfillment because we're constantly realizing these things aren't adding to our happiness. Therefore, we're stressing and looking for more and more ways to find happiness. And as you can see on the graph, ultimately it gets to a point where the more you spend, the less fulfillment you have. So how do we understand this and how do we really take charge of you know, our lives and not put money at the center of it so we can live a fulfilling life? Well, number one, Understand more items equals more problems and upkeep. Buying a boat is great, um, you know, and I think boats are fantastic, but understand that when you buy a boat, it's not about, you don't just buy a boat and then instantly get these great experiences. There's going to be a lot of upkeep, there's going to be taxes, there's going to be cleaning fees, there's going to be all sorts of things associated with that buy that boat. And later on when you speak to someone who bought a boat, they go, oh, we should never bought that boat. So really put yourself in the place that before you buy, it's only normal to think about all the good things, but think about the upkeep, maintenance, and changes it will make to your life. Number two, more material things equal less time. When you build the pool in your backyard, which is great, I love to swim, understand you'll be cleaning that pool. How much of your life are you willing to give up in order to, one, buy it because it might take three years of saving and two, maintain it. Is it worth having a pool when if you have to spend three hours a week cleaning it or is it better just to go to the beach like you normally do? Number three, more items equals more to lose. And you know, this is really, really important. So many people buy beautiful sports cars and then don't know where to park them because they're scared they're gonna get scratched. So many people buy beautiful jewelry and luxurious items only have to stress about their home security because they're worried about something, someone breaking in. More items equals more to lose. I definitely understand this. I know when I take too many things out with me, I always forget something. Number four, 
internal enough versus keeping up enough. We know when we have enough. We know when we're, you know, we know that, you know, we when we put on our shoes, our shirt, and our jeans, we've got enough. But then there's the external enough, which is, I wonder if people, you know, I better put that nice watch on because I want to impress some people. You know what, I might put some cologne on so I smell it really. And all of a sudden, there's a difference between the enough that we're happy with and then the enough we want other people to be happy with. And interestingly, because it's such a varied environment we live in, you can never make those people happy. So it's more important to have your enough versus your self-esteem enough. Five, purpose is not made of things. You know, so many, Van Gogh sold one painting in his lifetime and he's considered arguably the greatest painter of all time. Your purpose in life will give you way more happiness than any object. And if you think about how much time you put into buying an object or saving for a house, have you put that same amount of time in your purpose? Because if you, if you want to be happy, which I know we all do, you put it into your purpose. Relationships are not things. Relationships are great. And you can take yourself to new levels on relationships and they can grow you like nothing else. But they're not things. They cannot be owned. They cannot be kept. They cannot be stored. And they cannot be, you know, manipulated. Although people try to do all those things. A relationship is perfect in the moment as long as you're giving. And if two people are giving, a relationship is fantastic. But we collect relationships. We go, I know this bloke, my girlfriend's hot, you know, um, my boyfriend has this job. We, we, we treat our relationships like things and ultimately by doing that, they fall over just like things do. Learn to love things, learn to love people and use things, not the other way around. Great song from Drake's second album, third album. And I really agree. We have learned to love things. You know, we've been told by capitalism, you know, love your BMW, love your triple A, you know, love your iPad. You can't love things. If you love things, that's weird. You know, it really, I think it's really weird that you love a thing. You can only love people because love is about a two-way street. It's about really giving. And I think can't love you back. Therefore, we need to cut that out of vocabulary. The trick of giving. So the trick of giving is really cool. There's a part of your brain, the reptilian brainstem, that doesn't understand the difference between giving and receiving. It sees it as one action. So interestingly, it lights up when you give and it lights up when you receive. So the good feelings you get when you give is the trick of giving because your brain at some level releases endorphins about receiving. So it's true, you know, it really is true. Life is about giving. Giving can be receiving. Another one, how many years of your life are you willing, willing to give up? Keith, a great friend of mine, said this, I think in New Zealand recently, he said, you know, that's what people need to think about. How much, many years of their life are they willing to give up? I'll tell you what, when you think about it that way, geez, you know, for an extra bedroom, would you be willing to give up two years of your life? And that's what you've done. You know, you scrimped and saved. You haven't allowed yourself to go on vacations. Was that two years worth it? If it is, great. If not, well, you can't get that time back. You can always build a room later. Second to last, know your outcome. If your outcome is to be happy and that's it, then you don't need to stress yourself out by putting these huge expenses on your credit card and buying new things. And finally, hoarding and inequality. It doesn't trickle down. Mitt Romney, um, the very interesting gentleman who ran for the presidential campaign of America, and his cronies, the 1%ers, the 85 people who own 99% of the world's wealth for fun bus, um, those individuals have a scam running and they call it the trickle-down economy. It's, 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 it's totally unproven, impractical, and anyone with a brain understands it's wrong, but it sounds cool, trickle-down, because we know things trickle-down. Give you an example. They say that, you know, I'm great because I earn $30 billion a year, and when I buy things, it trickles down to the economy. Is that so true? I mean, rip, how much food does Mitt Romney eat at a restaurant? Does he eat 5,000 people's worth of food? Because he earns 5,000 people's worth of, of money. No, what he does is he buys shares, he puts money into hedge funds, he buys six or seven boats, five or six houses, and they hoard and collect. They collect artwork, they hoard these things. So the money's not being used in the economy, it's being used by these Monty burns like type characters who are just hoarding that money and not putting it in the economy. You know who puts money in the economy? The mother who earns $33,000 a year trying to look after a baby buying diapers at the supermarket. They're putting money into the economy. This trickle down scam is being told to you by the new aristocracy, the new kings and queens of the world who were the same dudes 500 years ago telling us we need them because you know they were born with special privileges and they should rule over us now we're just getting scams like the trickle down economy don't listen to it you can have the life of your dreams simply by putting your life before your money it's your money or, or your life it's a difficult choice you need to think about it and it's something to think about i can't wait to see you tomorrow until then goodbye